Well, this morning we are turning to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. I'll share the rest of the words that the children, uh, or that I shared with the children. We'll go beyond verses um, 1 and 2, uh, looking at how we can let our light shine today. And uh, we're looking at, again, Ephesians 5, chapter 1 through 14. Paul writes, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not, even, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God wrath, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But, in everything, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And may God add a blessing to the reading of the, his word this morning. Well, as we wrap up this series, Let Your Light Shine, I want to begin by just sharing what I've been learning uh, about the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, and uh, that may cause you to nod off already, but I've been reading this book by David McCullough uh, called The Great Bridge, and it's fascinating you read how the Brooklyn B Bridge was built back in the 1870s, one of the most amazing feats of engineering, uh, certainly at that time period. And I don't know about you, but I wondered how did they ever get down into the river to build the foundation for this bridge? And uh, the way that it worked is they built these giant caissons, which were like boxes. I, are there any civil engineers here? Because I'll really get nervous. It's like when you're a pastor preaching to like a Greek professor and you don't want to mess anything up. That's how I'm feeling, you know, talking about a bridge if there's any civil engineers here. But they built these, these giant caissons that were like boxes made out of wood and metal and there was no bottom to it, and they, they layered the top with lots of wood and metal, and then they floated these out into the proper place with the barges, and then they sunk down into the water, and then eventually down into the sediment at the bottom of the river, and then they had shafts where the workers would go down into the shaft, and the air would be pumped in, and the sediment, and everything would be lifted out as they excavated these caissons, and then when they finally reached a, a depth of uh, and had the, removed the sediment that could support the weight of the 300-foot tower that could support the bridge, then they filled the caisson with concrete, and that became the foundation for the giant uh, towers that were part of the Br Brooklyn Bridge. So imagine being one of these 600 workers who would crawl down through the shaft, through the water, th into the caisson, deep beneath the surface of the river, where they would be working with based on uh, gas lights and, and very dim lighting, uh, where it was very dank and, and misty to, to prepare to build these foundations for the bridge. And the problem with these is that eventually the workers started to end up with this mysterious illness, terrible pain in their joints, some had convulsions, uh, some got sick to their stomachs, uh, some even died from going down into these caissons, and they didn't know uh, what was going on, and uh, eventually they discovered what was happening. With a pressurized air that was double what the atmospheric pressure was up out in the surface, they were suffering from what scuba divers would suffer from if they didn't uh, ascend very, very slowly, and that was the bends. And nitri nitrogen bubbles would block the transportation of oxygen throughout the body, and these uh, workers were suffering from the bends and uh, severe pain, some even died. And uh, as they went down into these dark caissons where the pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure, was much greater than the pressure uh, at the surface of the water. I share that because that reminds me of what life is like in our world. That we live in a world where 
oftentimes there is not light. And not only is there not light, but there's like a weightiness to the problems of this world. Do you ever feel like there's a weightiness right now with all that's going on in our world and in our nation? Do you kind of feel like there's extra pressure down on you and everyone's at a sense of like fight or flight, it feels like, and there's just the weight of the world on people and there's also the dim, dimness or the darkness of this world and, and it's kind of like a case on. And, and here's the other thing. There's also a mysterious, to many in this world, there is a mysterious illness that they don't even realize they suffer from, and that's a human condition of sin that every human, I'm not pointing fingers except at all of us. There's the human condition of sin that gets into us and rots us from the inside out, and it causes pain, and many people, if they're not theologically astute, they don't know that the problem that infects the human heart is sin. And that is the root cause of our relationship trouble. That is the root cause of being discontented. That is the root cause of why there's violence and selfishness and lust and greed and all of the the violence and the problems in this world. And so people live life in dimness, in darkness, with this pressure, with this weight on them, and they suffer from the mysterious illness. Now, the thing about the caissons is the only way to get out properly through these shafts without being affected by the bends was to ascend very, very slowly through the shaft, just like a scuba diver has to ascend very slowly or else they will suffer from the bends and from that mysterious illness. There was a specific way they had to get out of the darkness of the caisson in the pressurized, extra pressurized environment and back out into the normal world. And for us in our world, there is one specific way to get out of this mysterious illness of sin and into the life that Christ has for us in the light, and that is through Christ. And people are trying to find a way in this world to get out of the effects of sin and out of the effects of the weightiness they feel And the one and only way, according to the scriptures, that we find for getting out of the darkness and into the light, out of the heaviness, and into a place where we can breathe deeply and and breathe easily, that's only through Christ. Amen? And what Jesus wants to do is just that. He wants to lead us out of the darkness, out of the heaviness of this world, into the light, and into a place where our lives are lighter, where we don't feel the weight and the burden of sin and conflict and anger and rage and bitterness and greed, but we're able to breathe deeply in the light of God's love. And that happens through a very specific way where we repent of our sin and we receive Christ into our lives and we ask him to make us new. And if you want to be free, if you've been feeling weighed down, if you've been feeling like you're in darkness, the way out is through Christ. And he graciously says, I will open up the shaft of of escape so that you can move out of the darkness and into the light. What I want to talk about this morning, church, is two types of light. And I'm going to break a cardinal rule in preaching, and that's that I'm going to mix metaphors. Two different images, but it's the same word, so hopefully you can track with me. And the the one word that I want to use with two metaphors is the word light. There are two types of light. There's the light that brightens the darkness, the light that shines and makes things bright. And there's light when it comes to heaviness. There's a lightness in not feeling weighed down. There are two types of light, one word, two types. And Jesus wants to be the way that we experience both of them in this world. The light of truth, the light of love that shines into our lives and changes us from the inside out. And he wants to be the answer for that heaviness we feel so that we live lighter through God's love and grace filling us and washing over us and transforming us. And so if you don't hear anything else that I'm going to share this morning, the message of good news for us is when the light of Christ shines in our lives, our lives get lighter. Notice I didn't say brighter because I'm mixing metaphors. When the light of God's love shines into our dark lives, that heaviness that we feel begins to go away and we're able to rise up and breathe easier and breathe more deeply and experience a levity of of life that we cannot experience apart from 
apart from God's truth and presence in us. You know, when I go and I meet, just like a couple mornings ago, when I met with Cheryl and Brian, knowing that they were going to be going to the hospital where Larry would be removed from life support, in many ways that's very heavy. But when I sat with them, I was able to explain the one hope we have in this world for someone facing that situation. And that is the light of Jesus' truth and promises, that this life is not the end, but, but we have everlasting life with Christ to look forward to. As I've often shared, there's that statement, resurrection, meaning the, prom- the promise of Jesus' resurrection, resurrection means the, last, the worst thing is never the last thing. Isn't that good news? No else in the world can that statement be said. In Christ, resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. We can experience lots of worst things in this world. And I don't, I don't need to, you know, bring anything to our imagination because we can quickly come up with these on our own. But resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Death, is, death may seem like the worst thing, but it's not the last thing because our hope is in Christ. And, Jesus, when, and that's the light of Jesus' word that shines into our lives and enables, and enables us to live life in a lighter way, not so weighed down by the pain and the tragedy of this dark world. We can get out of the darkness, we can get out of the heaviness of life by experience, experiencing the grace of Christ in our lives. This morning, I want us to flesh this out a little bit by looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 14 that I read. But again, the main point here this morning is that when the light of Christ shines in any life, life for that person becomes lighter, not so weighed down, not so heavy, not so oppressive, because Jesus is at work to set us free and give us hope. And so I want to talk about three sub-points to walk of walking in the light uh, as we seek to live life in a, in a lighter way. And number one is first we walk in the light of our belovedness. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Notice he doesn't say follow God's example so that you can be loved. He says, but as dearly loved children, walk in the light of in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's through the light of Christ and the love of Christ in us that we're enabled to live differently. You know, this is different from the way people understand religion. Our religion is not a performance-based faith. It's a, it's a, it's a response base where Christ acts first. He loves us and we're enabled to love. He doesn't say, I will love you if... He says, I love you unconditionally. I love you, period. And that, then we're able to uh, live lives of love as a response. Listen to what scholar Ben Witherington writes. We've had him at, the, at Family Bible Camp before. And in, in his Roman, book on Romans, he writes this, God's love tells us everything about God's character and nothing about ours. Aren't you glad God's love is based on his character and not ours? God's love tells us everything about God's character and nothing about ours except our need. When someone loves you in spite of your previous behavior and during the very time when you were behaving in a manner that should have disqualified you from receiving such a blessed gift, then you are dealing with divine love. That's the way God loves us. It's not a condition-based love, it's unconditional. And that's the way God loves us. And when we walk in love, as, when we walk as dearly loved children, and by the way, Paul uses the words walk and live as the same verb, as the same word. To walk in the way of love is the same to live in the way of love. But when we know that we are dearly loved children, just that in and of itself is going to bring light, lightness to our lives. That's going to bring levity. That's going to, that's going to put a little bounce in our step. We wake up in the morning and we say, God, no matter how well or how poorly I perform, and we're not performing for God, but no matter how well I do or no matter how many times I mess up today, you are going to love me unconditionally. Thank you, God. That should get you out of bed in the morning with a bounce in your step. And as we receive that love, we're able to translate that into love for others. So the first way we we live in the light of God's uh, love is, um, that's the first way, is by living out our belovedness. 
and our, our lives of sacrifice, our lives of service, everything that we do for God flows out of his activity in our lives first. We love because he first loved us. And that's one way to live in the light of God's love. The second thing I want to talk about that this chapter talks about is walking in the light of gratitude as we leave our sin behind. And I want to read these verses again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, because now Paul talks about if we're going to walk as children of the light, we're going to leave these things behind. We're going to leave the darkness and sin behind. And so Paul says, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. There is a lot more than a hint of sexual immorality all around us every day. This is like saying, you know, this is like swimming through a muddy pond and saying, don't get dirty, you know, I mean, but it's a challenge. We need to look to God for wisdom and grace. But he says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Holy means we're just set apart as God's people. And to live a life that is holy unto God means that we are separate from a world that's just immersed in sexual immorality and a world that's been like that. And although things seem to go in cycles, I mean, in many ways, our world is becoming more like ancient Rome every day, it feels like. There shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. Notice these are, we tend to sometimes rank sins. Paul just lists these all together. Uh, Or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's a very stark warning that we want to inherit inherit the kingdom of God. We want to inherit everlasting life. So we want to really pay attention to this word and uh, leave behind these things. But what strikes me in this section is where Paul says, all of these sins are out of place, Uh, There's no place in the life of a believer for these, but instead, rather thanksgiving. And I thought, that's interesting to me, that Paul says all of these sinful behaviors, immorality, impurity, coarse talk and joking, all of that should be replaced with thanksgiving. Isn't that interesting? I might think, you know, pure talk or, you know, something else. But Paul says thanksgiving, and and it dawned on me as I was studying this week, thanksgiving is both a precursor or sorry, we're supposed to be thankful in gratitude, so an unwillingness to be thankful or just being uh, neglectful of our need to be thankful, in gratitude is both a precursor and a consequence of sin. So often when we are engaging in sinful behavior, it's because we're not thankful for something in that area of our lives. And it brought me back to Genesis chapter 1 where God gives Adam and Eve everything. You have each other. You have all the fruit and everything in this garden except the fruit from one tree. And what do Adam and Eve do? Knuckleheads. They eat from the one tree they're forbidden forbidden from. And it goes back to ingratitude. Can you imagine if you're God and I've given you each other as, as a beautiful bond, as a beautiful married couple. I've given you everything in this garden. I command you not to eat from one tree. And you can't be grateful enough to just enjoy everything else. You have to go to the one tree that I've commanded you not to eat from. And so often, as we think about the the sin in our lives, the root of that is often ingratitude. Where does greed come from? Ingratitude. I want more. I'm not satisfied with what I have. I have to go pursue this. Where does lust come from? It comes from not having... uh, not having healthy relationships in a way that God would want us to. It, see, it means viewing people as objects instead of as precious people created in the image of God. It's like saying, well, I'm not grateful for this person created in the image of God that I can have a healthy, unselfish relationship with, so I'm going to be ungrateful and operate out of lust where I objectify somebody and treat them as an object rather than a beautiful person created in the image of God. We could flesh this out. But maybe just for your own time with the Lord this week, just go to the Lord in prayer and say, how am I tempted or how does ingratitude lead to temptation in my life? Whether that's greed or lust or, you know, even if we think about bitterness, 
Where does bitterness come from? If we are bitter and unforgiving towards someone, we are not being grateful for the ways that God has forgiven us and and welcomed us back into fellowship with him. If we are holding a grudge against somebody else, we are not grateful for for the fact that God has released us from any grudge he would have towards us. Do you see how every sin, every temptation in our lives can be traced back to an ungrateful spirit, an an inability or an unwillingness to be grateful? This shouldn't be something that's heavy for us. This in itself should be something that brings us to a lighter place in our lives. Because when we are filled with gratitude, whoa, does life get lighter. If we're operating from a place of lack or a place of um, greed or a place of fear, we're going we're gonna to experience the weight and the pressure down upon us every single day. But when we wake up in the morning and we are grateful, maybe the best thing we could do is wake up and thank God for 10 things every morning. But when we have, ingratitu- or when we have gratitude filling our hearts, all of a sudden it changes our perspective. And so we walk around grateful for the blessings of God in our lives. And that, that eliminates the temptation uh, that, that, that sin would try to, um, you know, put to work in us. When we are grateful, we're walking around praising God at every opportunity. And that keeps us from the allure, from the darkness of sin. Sin weighs us down. You know, it's not like if we're greedy and then we go after more and attain more, that then, oh, life is lighter because I got what I wanted. No, if we're operating from that place of greed, what do we want after we get what we were going after? Well, I want more, you know? Yes, there's that old saying, you know, how much money is enough? The rich person was asked, just a little bit more, you know? And uh, that's, that's the root of so much sin is ingratitude. But if we walk in gratitude, boy, will our lives take on a lighter, more joyful feel. The third point I want to focus on as we think about uh, living in the light of God that makes life lighter, finally, walk in the light of your identity. And here, Paul paints a stark contrast between uh, the unbeliever and the believer, but listen to this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Huge contrast. You were darkness, now you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes, illuminated becomes a light. That, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so if we walk in our identity as children of light, our, our lives will take on deeds of righteousness and justice and goodness. Notice we don't try to conjure up all these things in ourselves, but we just live out our identity knowing Christ looks at us and says, because of what I have done for you, because of what I have made you, you are light in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. You do not perform your way to this identity. By grace, you are given this identity. And then the the fruitful deeds flow out of who Christ has made you. This week, I read an article, How Are You Managing? by Lori Rambo, and she was talking about the negative things that show us that we're not uh, living according to the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'm, I'm flipping these around and making them positive. And so if we're living as children of the light, living out our identity, here are just some examples of how we do that. If we're living out our identity as children of light, we're exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of self. If that's new to you, go to Galatians 5 and read about love, joy, peace, patience, all the fruit of the Spirit. Are we exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of self? If we're living as children of the light, it's going to be the fruit of the Spirit. If we're living as children of the light, we have an appetite for God's word and the things of God. Another one is our motivations are Christ-centered, not self-centered. We pray first and then we act. Uh, We leave behind anxiety and loneliness and the feelings of being unloved or defeated by never measuring up because we know who we are in Christ. So this morning I want to ask, are you living in the light of Jesus Christ in such a way that you are being made lighter? 
Does life take on this joy and this feeling of levity because you know that Jesus is at the helm in your life? His light is shining in you and through you. I want to just close with one personal story and uh, then we'll wrap up this morning. But, um, you know, when you've been somewhere eight years, you don't know if you've told the story once, three times, 12 times. Hopefully none of you remember either. But uh, I, one, of the, one of the seasons in my life that was uh, particularly difficult was when we were moving away from Buffalo and I was preparing to go to Asbury Seminary for the doctoral program there. And we were selling our house that was a, a fixer-upper money pit, to say the least, after Heather and I had been there four years. Little Ben was one and a half years old at the time. And, uh, you know, people always say to my mother-in-law, what is Dave like when he's not at church? She, this, is, this is something she'll remember. This is how Dave was when he was not at church. But anyway, you can, you can ask her later about these things. But, um, you know, we were selling this house, and, you know, I don't know about you, you know, Selling real estate is kind of like getting 13 teeth pulled, you know? There's all these things that you have to do when you're going through a, a, a stressful transaction like that. But um, anyway, the, the house was stressful from the moment we got there. We bought our house at closing. Our lawyer said, oh, just by, by the way, the person you're buying this house, it's a lawyer who's been disbarred. And that's not what you want to hear at the closing when you're buying real estate. It's, oh, you're buying this from a crook who was disbarred, so just want to let you know that. It's like, thank you. You could have told us that uh, before. But anyway, it, w- it was a money pit. Every, at every turn, we found rotted two-by-fours behind paneling and all kinds of uh, terrible surprises. But... Um, you know, it's stressful. We're thinking about, we were leaving this church where we love the people. Uh, I, was, I was a youth pastor there for four years, and we were preparing to move to Kentucky, and we had to sell this house. And I was kind of annoyed at our real estate agent because she said, oh, I think you should mark the price right here. And I'm thinking, I think up here. And, you know, it ended up selling in like hours. And I'm like, we could have sold it up here. And anyway, so that was frustrating. Um, but, you know, I've, I know this is the next big thing is after we had negotiated the price and we're dealing with all this stress, then we get the report that the septic test fails right? Because Heather and me and little Ben abused the septic system so much in our three short years at that house that it passed when we bought the house and then it failed when we were selling the house. So there's an extra $6,200, who's counting, but of, of money that, you know, and so, you know, and during that time I was reading about investing and how if you invest your money right, you know, you can double your money every seven years. So in my head, this don't do this, but I thought, oh, that $6,200 problem, that's like a $100,000 problem at the time of retirement. And so that, that did not make anything, you know, better at all. And during this time, we, you know, but anyway, we, were, we had the septic work done. Finally, we went to New Jersey for a few days to b- visit Brian and Joan, and we thought, well, at least, you know, the septic is in, everything's going to close, we're, we're preparing for this move to Kentucky, and I thought things were good, and then we get the call while we're in New Jersey from our real estate agent, just so you know, um, you need to go do work on the lawn because the, the buyer is very upset that the grass in the backyard is not in the same condition it was when they looked at the house. And I, I, <laughs> I think I remain Christ-like somewhat. I was a little, I was upset. We were at a park, and I get this phone call, and I'm thinking, The buyers just got a $6,200 septic system brand new put in for them after they negotiated the price of the house. How could they be upset? But anyway, so, oh, I was was so mad because it's like, they got a brand new septic system. They should be happy with that and they can, you know, fix the lawn themselves. So I was stressed out. We drive from New Jersey to Buffalo. The next morning I go to Home Depot and I rent a rototiller. And I, I rented that rototiller, and I was rototilling like a madman. I was like rage rototilling to smooth out these tractor ruts, you know. And, and actually, that was very satisfying to rage rototill through the backyard. But I had to do that, and then I finally had to put the, the grass seed down and water it, and the grass, you know, was, was in, it was prepared, it was growing and, and, you know, kind of put back into the condition it was when I saw the house. And, um, but anyway, at some point, I realized that I was feeling very weighed down by my circumstances and by my attitude. And everything that I was thinking about was about all the problems I have and all the things that are not going right, and I was feeling the heaviness and the weight. And at some point, after, maybe it was the rage rototilling and prayer, that combination that helped <laughs> turn me around. But after a while, I, I realized, my goodness, if I... I just need to change my attitude. And I don't know exactly where I was or exactly when that happened, but I thought, I have a beautiful wife and a healthy little one-and-a-half-year-old boy, and I'm going to a program where I'm going to get paid to be in school to, 
to learn under the best Christian minds in the world. And I'm on my way to just take the next step that God has for me. And in the big, real, in the big scheme of life, what is this earthly stuff that's weighing me down? When I can focus on the light of God's presence in my life and all that he is doing and all that he is blessing me with, and I needed the light of God's word to come and shine into my life to help me see where my attitude was completely off. And you know what? What a better way to live, you know, to start focusing on the blessings of Christ in your life, the light of God's presence, the light of his word that, that shines in the, in the complex fog of our circumstances to illuminate our way and to illuminate our path. And even when we go through trials, to know that God is present and he is the one who never fails us or abandons us. What a blessing, even through the trials, to experience the light of God's presence in the midst of the stress and the struggle. But friends, that's what, that's what Jesus does. And that was just one example in my life when everything changed, when I just focused on the light of Christ instead of the momentary struggles and trials I was facing. And so as we wrap up, as a church, our mission is to do what the Holy Spirit, and I'm sure other Christians in my life at that time, played a part for me, but our job is to shine the spotlight of Christ's love and truth into the lives of others so that those who are oppressed and weighed down by the heaviness of sin and shame and fear and hopelessness can start living in a much more hope-filled light way because the light of Christ is shining through them. I always say the, the Christian life is the greatest pay-it-forward movement this world will ever know, where we experience the light of Christ and the light that that brings to our lives, and then we go and we share it with others. And when we get the focus off ourselves, how much brighter and lighter is life when we're living in that way? And so that's, that's my prayer. And as we, as we close this morning, I just want you to think about how has Christ shined his light and his love into your life? How does he want to do that so that your life can be made lighter? What's weighing you down? Because Christ wants to shine his light into that area of your life. And as a church, how do we do this? The last part that Paul writes about is live as children of the light with fruitful deeds rather than the deeds of darkness. So we don't just say, yay, I'm living in the light of the Lord. We put this into action through our service through our love, through our giving. How does God want you to put, your, put his light into action through the way that you give, uh, through the way that you offer your time, through the way that you give yourself? Um, as we close this morning, I want us to be in prayer uh, about how we give our time, how we serve others, because that's a fragrant offering unto God, as I shared with the kids. And be thinking and praying about your faith promise. Uh, and, you know, we could share a lot about this. I will share about it next week as well. But the faith promise is simply the above and beyond giving, above the general fund and what we have to, you know, to pay for our programs and our budget and all of those things. The faith promise is the designated above and beyond sacrificial giving that goes completely beyond the walls of this church to shine the light of Christ into the lives of people. And it goes to support missionaries around the world, it goes to support children in our community going to camp. It goes to support the camp at Finley. It goes to support the international student ministry we do every year where we shine the light and love of Christ into 40 or 50 international students. But be praying about this. You know, one thing about giving, you know, whenever Christians talk about money, sometimes that can feel like a heaviness. It should feel nothing like heaviness. The scriptures say God loves a cheerful giver. And it, one of the great responsibilities and privileges of a believer is to say, Lord, I don't have to give because I'm weighed down and feeling judged. But because of the light of your love in my life, I rise with joy for the, op for the opportunity to give. And so the, the way that I would want us to approach this is just to, to come before the Lord with our spouse, with our family, and just say, Lord, first of all, what would be the percentage of, in the, percentage of the income that you've blessed me with that you would want me to give as a first fruit for you. And, and that should be a prayerful, giving to the Lord should not be like leftovers. It shouldn't be like, oh, what are people around me doing? I better put something in. It has nothing to do with that. If giving is something heavy for us, we're not giving with the right mindset Christ wants us to have. But I believe every believer should say, Lord, what is it that would be a faithful percentage of my income? 
You know, the Old Testament uses the tithe or 10% uh, as, a, as, a, as a guideline, but we're not legalistic about that. But we pray about that, and then missions giving is that be above and beyond giving, where maybe we say, you know, as a family, we're going to eat out one less time a month or two less times a month, and we're going to give to the missions program. And, you know, we don't do a pledge card for any of our giving except missions. And here's why we do it. Because we commit to missionaries around the world where we say, as a church, we're going to sponsor you $500 for this year, or we're going to sponsor you $400 this year. And when we, in good faith, tell a missionary, we're going to sponsor you for this amount of dollars, we don't want, as a church, to say, well, we're going to sponsor you and then not come, not, you know, we trust God with our, our general fund and our budget that God is going to provide, but when we make a commitment to missionaries and mission organizations, we, the missions team wants to know so that they can make a good faith commitment to the missionaries and the organizations we serve. And, um, you know, as we close, how is Jesus wanting to shine his light into your life today so that your life would become lighter? And how does Jesus want to shine his light and love through us to the world around us? And let's ask God how he would want us to be a part in that. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that because of your grace and love, we don't have to be weighed down by the cares of this world, but we can experience that your grace that raises us up, your grace that makes us new, your grace that shines in the darkness, your grace that makes us uh, family united in love. Lord Jesus, I pray for each and every person here. I pray for the person who feels weighed down and oppressed by the cares of this life. Jesus, would you reveal yourself to whoever that is? Lord, would you come into our lives and cleanse our sins and make us one with you so that we can experience life the way you intend us to live, live it? Lord, come into our lives, speak to our hearts, and help us to respond in a way that would please and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for coming to worship this morning. Let's continue to be in prayer about how we can be the light to those around us as we share the love of Christ, um, that we might live life in a lighter way, but we might be a blessing to others, that they might discover how Christ can help them live with a little more bounce in their step. Uh, again, I want to thank you for coming to worship. What a blessing, Barb, what a blessing uh, to serve together as family. Uh, let's ask for the Holy Spirit to lead us this week to be the hands and feet of Christ. And uh, let's go out this week to love Jesus and love the world as we live our lives as a fragrant offering unto him. As you go, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.